Hi, everybody. It's Friday. It's uh, October 15th. Is that right? Um, let me look at the calendar. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it's October 15th, and um, this is the true community gathering uh, at a new time. We're now starting at 5 o'clock instead of 4.30. Um, so uh, any of, the, of you out there who want to actually join us live and be part of the community, uh, I invite you to come and join us at 5 o'clock on fr any Friday. Uh, email us so I can uh, send you a Zoom link. Uh, our email address is trunltd at aol.com. So, Theater Resources Unlimited, we're a uh, producer's organization uh, by mission. Uh, in practice, we actually help people who are not necessarily producers. Uh, we help writers, we help directors, we help actors, we help, we help everybody. We're here to basically help the community. We're very much into community, which is why we do this. Um, last April, April 17th, 2020, uh, I did this first meeting with everybody because people were feeling lost and confused and not sure what to do with something called COVID and how to, how to deal with it all. And um, we thought it was a good idea to have a little room, a little Zoom room, a little Zoom room of our own where everybody could come and talk about who they are and what they're doing and have a voice, um, be heard by people that weren't necessarily in their own apartments. So that's why we're here and that's why we've been doing this for a year and a half. I think this is number 74. I'm not sure. I have to, I have to, I have to count again. I keep losing count, but this is the 74th one we've done. Uh, we talk about over the years, we've talked over the year and a half, we've talked about a lot of things that are COVID related. Um, I think going forward, we're going to continue to have COVID as part of our conversation because it's something that has really uh, impacted us uh, in, in amazing ways. Um, not necessarily all negative ways. Uh, we, I think we were, we're, all, we're all stronger for it. Uh, we've all realized that the world is unpredictable. Uh, we, we all realize that we can't take things for granted. And uh, we've found ways to adapt and adjust and, and grow and evolve. And uh, I'm very proud of the community that I that I see every week because uh, nobody had nobody was really well. I shouldn't say nobody, but most people were not stopped cold by COVID. Uh, most people found ways to adapt and adjust and and, and go on uh, in spite of the challenge of it all. So uh, now we're at a part point where we are seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. I think we are seeing a real light. I don't think it's a, a false light. I think it's something that really is there. I think there really is hope up ahead. Um, the vaccine has been effective in reducing the outbreaks of, of, of disease in, in the world. Um, and it seems to be something that is working. I know there are people that are resistant to the vaccine. Um, I can't make choices for other people. Uh, I can say that the choices that other people are making affect us. And I hope that they realize that. Uh, if we'd all been vaccinated th three months ago, we probably would be a lot farther along. But we are farther along than we than we were last year. So let's celebrate that. Let's be um, thankful that we are back in live theater, li live performances here. Um, I, I'm going to bring in a, a dear friend of mine. She's somebody I've known for many years, almost since the start of True. Um, Quinn Lemley is a, an artist. A cab, she's a cabaret artist. She's an actress. I don't know how to classify her in, in a way that she would, that will please her. So I'm going to have her classify herself when she comes in. Um, and she's she's really made a name for herself in our business, uh, touring with with one. A one woman show with several one woman, sh woman shows as a matter of fact and the amazing thing is that she's toured and she's played major venues around the country um, and I think that that's worth talking about um, because I think a lot of us have hopes of getting our work out and around and touring and Quinn you made it happen and so you're gonna you're gonna tell us how you did that you're going to probably tell us, I don't know how I did it, but it happened. But we're going to, we're going to sort of probe and we're going to try to find things that, that worked, things that, that people can take with them and, and go forward and say, that's, that's a good way of doing it. I'm going to try that. Um, so say hi. How do, you, how do you classify yourself, oh. Miss Hayworth? 
<laughs> well, thank you, Bob. I, I am so honored to be here and to be in such a group of talented, creative people. I mean, this is just really, really exciting. And um, thank you for the lovely in introduction. Oh. So, but I. Well, I, we're, we're, d we're good friends. We've known each other a long time. From the beginning. Of We've truth. been through a lot of ups and downs. Yes, definitely. But I, um, I started my career um, in, in cabaret and w with the show that I'm actually bringing back, which I'll, I'll, t I'll talk about it, it's called Rita Hayworth, The Heat Is On. And I started in the back room of Don't Tell Mamas with a, with a, a quartet. And it, it has evolved along the way. And we played major performing arts centers all over the country and Canada. And uh, like the Kravitz Center, we started out in Rinker Hall, and then we went, we, we headlined twice at the Dreyfus Hall, which is the big um, theater there that's so spectacular. But I mean, I've been really, really lucky. I, it, but it took um, my manager, my husband, co producer, Paul Horton, to um, open up, open up the, the, the vehicle. Because when we first started doing the show, we were only, well, we were telling stories, but we were um, using the music from the films that Rita Hayworth did. And um, so when I met Paul, he was representing Carrie Hoffman. He took him from the Carnegie Club to major performing arts centers in his, uh, his show about Frank Sinatra. And he represented Everybody Loves Raymond and the OJs. And he did, he did, he was representing all these R&B artists at the time. And he so, was like, so I have, to, I have to tell you, Quinn. One of the, one of the things a lot of a lot of people ask me is, how do I get somebody to represent me? And I think oh, the, the answer is marry them. Well, <laughs> and it, no, it did. Well, it, it only took us fifteen years <laughs> to get married. Okay. But um, but anyway, no. I I'll I'll tell you what happened was I got um, Musical America. My friend was working at. He was the arts um, editor for Travel and Leisure. And so I borrowed Musical America and I read about every manager and, and who they were representing and who was like me or similar to me and who could take me from the small rooms, from the intimate, because I was playing cabarets and then I was also doing smaller theaters, you know, like 200 seat theaters. And Are you talking I, about in, in New York or, or around the country? No, all over the country. All over the country, well, and, okay. and in New York, and, and well, well, all let's over. let's clarify one thing first of all. Um, a lot of people have cabaret careers, and it's really New York centric. They're, they're, it's Don't Tell Mamas, it's Triad, it's it's whatever we have here in uh, the duplex. Like, I have to, I, I can't not mention my friends. Um, right, of but course. but you you from the from the start, how did you how did you make the transition from being in New York cabarets and clubs to actually getting outside of New York and on tour. I think that's a mystery to some people. It is a mystery. I mean, I can tell you, um, it, it's funny because my, my international career started um, because I had great press shots. I mean, I, I really live in that whole world of glamour and, um, you know, I'm a throwback, I'm, con I'm contemporary, but I'm a throwback to the 40s, 50s and 60s. And um, I like, my see, I, I had great imagery and I got booked at the Half Note in Athens, Greece, and I went back every other year until pre, you know, until right when the economy collapsed in, in uh, Greece. But we, we played for almost 15 years, every other, every other Christmas, every other New Year's for 10 shows. And that was really exciting because world renowned jazz artists. So I just, I was doing a cabaret or a nightclub act. And, um, and it was all a nod to all of the great female singers and the movie stars and so on. And it's so fun to see like Greek men with all the chains going, oh, my heart belongs to daddy. You know, all these fun, <laughs> you know, they like Marilyn Monroe and all of that. So um, that was really, I, I, that was a catalyst. And then I took chances. I went to, I had a friend that she was a comedian and her husband said, oh, she's not happy. Would you go to um, Los Angeles for pilot season with her? And I said, oh yeah, I'll go if, um, if we can manifest a free house. And we did, we, we got this fabulous house for free for six months in Encino. And we just had to take care of the gardener and the pool boy and the housekeeper for these people. And we went on auditions. We were like a married couple and, and cause we only had one car. 
and she was doing really well commercially and I was going to like all the auditions and I'm somebody who had never been out by myself. I'd never been to a movie by myself or a restaurant and I forced myself to go to every open mic every night by myself. And it was through that that I met Luke Yankee. I don't know if you know. I know Luke Yankee. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, he's one of my dear Eileen friends. Heckard's son. Yes, Eileen Heckard's son. And he's got a, a play on Marilyn and Eileen and Bus Top that is just phenomenal. We saw the reading and it's going to be produced. So I'm just really excited. We did a play of his. Oh, he, was a true, he was a True Voices finalist. Oh, my gosh. Well, he's I, I love him. But he was, he was sort of my... Um, guide in Los Angeles and he was like I have this friend Ron Salona he opened this theater in Palm Palm Springs my friend in Palm Springs I was just at we were just at the show at um we were doing our queen the ultimate queen celebration we were in Palm Springs last weekend so it's a small world oh and, Randall oh Randall, <laughs> Randall spectacular I mean, spectacular <laughs> Yeah, for the YouTube viewers, we have somebody somebody in our community who always boasts about living in Palm Springs. Well, it's pretty fabulous. I, <laughs> I gather, I gather it is. It is. It was amazing, and um, so and so. Anyway, I he, I met Ron, and he put me. Um, so he brought my Rita Hayward show to Palm Springs, and I had a, I had a two week run. And we had billboards all, we had three billboards and and it was just really wonderful because the whole um, community came and uh, the, the Hollywood community came and people that knew Rita Hayworth and I got rave reviews. And it was because of that, that I met, that Paul took my call when I had written to him about, after I researched him and in Musical America and he um, met with me and started working with me and he really changed my life. Well, his company's name was, was what, 20th century? Uh, Cent no, tw <laughs> Century Artists. Century, yeah. Century Arts, that's what it is. Yeah, and so, and he had me thinking about things in a different way because when, especially when you're a solo artist or you're um, in cabaret, we can become so insular and you're not thinking about the market, especially the performing arts center market, which is it's it's great because they have subscriptions and you're not having to um fill the seat every seat yourself you know we're in cabaret you have to you know it, it can be a, a challenge and it's and so he was like why don't you you it's the golden age of hollywood you're telling these stories of orson wells and dick Hames and harry Cohn, and why don't you open it up to the music that was the fabric of her life and that changed my life because we have Sinatra songs in there. We have Dick Hames songs. We have like all of the great, you know, Rogers and Hart songs that it, Rita wasn't a singer. She was a dancer who was um, uh, Anita Ellis and Nan Wynn and Joanne Greer dubbed her voice, but people didn't know. It was kept such a secret. Weren't they there some, like wasn't there something where she did her own singing? Yes, in um, the, when she's playing the guitar in in um, put the blame on Mame in Gilda, and that was and she that was a big contention for her and the Columbia um, Studios boss Harry Cohn. He tried to like keep her in his purview by by dubbing her, and that was just a way of keeping her down. Oh. But she did she did get um, applause. Um, she was going to take over from Betty Bacall. And I had the when I first moved to New York, I met Ron Field, and he wanted me to work on a program about Jack Cole, Gwen Verdon, Rita, and Marilyn. So that was really his stories were amazing. Did you did you ever meet Rita? I I didn't. I oh. I mean I just you know she had Alzheimer's by the time I um, came into New. When, by the time I went to NYU, I was I was much younger, and and you know she was in, at the very end of her life. So, I wish I, I wish I had known her when she was, re was still Rita. Yeah, it's it's a it's a sad story. It is a sad story about that. So I think there are there are other. Th uh, be well, let's let's talk a little bit more about Rita. Then I'm gonna, I actually want to talk about some other things that you did because you you you've mm -hmm. created success for yourself in many ways. I think the overview that I wanted to look at was how you built your brand. If if if, if that's a conversation that you're comfortable having. Sure. Um, I, deliberately. 
I mean, I was very mindful, you know, I mean, since I do live in this area, I mean, every press photo, every everything that we were putting out. Oh, you said that's I wanted to call that out before you said that something very important earlier. You said one of the things that you think made the difference was for you was that you had terrific press shots. And that, that is actually a, 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 a lesson for everybody uh, in cabaret or theater. The press shots are so in, incredibly important. Um, I mean, look at like Dita Von Teese, I mean, or whatever artist. I mean, it, it really doesn't matter that the, the shots have to be provocative and they have to give a message of what you're selling. And so- Well, I mean, we know what you're yeah. selling. Well, <laughs> glamour, little, yeah. Um, you know, it's all it's all fun. And, um, you know, I just ma really made sure that that all the imagery looked like that. And we and the same thing when we did burlesque to Broadway that we that we, I need Paul said I needed another show. And so we were we were trying to figure out what to do. And I, at first I thought, oh, well, I wonder who Gypsy Rose Lee was. She was so intriguing to me. And I did all this research. And but then I didn't really um, like the character as much as like in the musical because it's so wonderful I, I was like what was her real act like and I, I did all this research and then I it came to me to do this show on burlesque to Broadway which was the celebrations of all the icons that went from burlesque to Broadway and beyond and, we and who, of, who would some of those be oh you know Mae West Sophie Tucker Fanny Bryce um Sally Rand we do the big and you do a fan and, dance Oh, of course. But, but Paul was really brilliant on this one because he said, it, let's not do a one woman show. It's it's it is like a one woman show, but it's like a Bette Midler concert. So I have four co-stars, four gorgeous girls, and I have a nine piece big band and it's just fantastic. And it's all brassy. And and we do, you know, everything from Broadway to pop. And I, I was shocked when he said, you have to do Johnny Lee Hooker's Boom Boom, like like Bruce Springsteen. And I'm like, me and three other, four other girls to, to do that? And um, it brings down the house. But we do like, you know, when you've got it flaunted and all of these great numbers. Well, let, let's look at a couple um, aspects of, of, the, of developing your show. Uh, let's let's take the the heat is on as, as an example the idea was yours or did somebody say hey you look like Rita Hayworth do a show I was doing a show off Broadway um, at the duo theater um, called born to rumba and I was playing this Cuban nun that becomes a, a showgirl from Havana and Richie Ridge you know Richie and, and Preston they came to see the show and he and his partner Richie said you look like Rita Hayworth. You need to meet. Um, you need to meet my friend Carter Inskeep, who wrote Always Patsy Cline. And so Carter and I. I mean, I had. I was just starting my career. This was my first job, and and uh, we met, and um, we just really connected. And we did. This was before YouTube and all of that. And we did all the. We go to the library, and look at microfiche, and our whole idea was like who was the real Rita Hayworth and who was Margarita Cancino? And I, want, I, want to I want to back up for one minute because I want to, I want to give context to everybody. Um, those of you who don't know the show, Always Paxi Klein, uh, it was one of the most successful cabaret shows ever created in New York. I mean, it was the, it was the, the touchstone for everybody. Everybody who was putting to get dead, together cabaret wanted to, wanted to find a way of doing an, uh, another Always Paxi Klein. Um, so Carter Carter was known for making magic and cabaret back then. So he was a good a good partner for you. Uh, he's uh, yes, he's 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 a dear friend and a great collaborator and a great partner. And and for this run, Paul said after COVID, we we've been so busy because I've um, I've been directing and producing with Paul other shows. And in 2019, we got married. And we were in New York for 14 nights because we were on the road. We produced the Ultimate Queen Celebration starring Mark Martell, who is the voice of Freddie Mercury in Bohemian Rhapsody. So we, we are like- That's some singing. Talent. Yeah, he's phenomenal. So anyway, I, so, so Paul said, I wanna bring you back to Don't Tell Mamas where your whole career began. And so I was like, 
okay, and I didn't think about doing Rita. I just thought I'd do, you know, a jazz set or whatever. And you know, Sidney Meyer says he he's the booking manager for Don't Tell Mama, and he's like, Quinn, darling, you you haven't done Rita in so long. You you, it's a new generation. They need to see it. And also with the U two, uh, the Me Too movement, and. And you know, life. I mean, I, I I'm looking at this for, as from a different perspective because I was so young when I first started the show, and Carter rewrote the entire book, and made it. It's so profound and smart and tight. And we just opened last month in September. Got a rave review in in cabaret scenes, and we just got extended till the end of March. We're just doing it as a residency, one you know, one show a month. We're going to play. I, next Thursday, October twenty first, and and so it's just a great way. We we went went from a, a twelve piece big band down to a quartet, and it's really intimate and up close and personal. And I hadn't been at, to Mama's until we did our photo shoot with with um, Sydney, and it was just so magical because if those walls could talk, all of the artists and the shows that have been created there, and just to be so up close and personal after having been on big stages. I mean, I've been playing 500 to 2,000 seat venues for the past 12 years. That that in itself is astonishes people. Um, everybody wants to get booked in those big venues. And, and was it is it just Paul's connections? Is it the show? <clears throat> what is the, what is the secret sauce? It's I think it's everything. I think you know I I have great reviews for the show and and there was great word of mouth and mm -hmm. the show you know pe people kept coming to see it and buyers and the word of mouth and Paul is so good at what he does and um, you know it it was great because we were playing all of these major, like we were at the Tillis Center and I was like on this, in the parking lot, I was like this big banner and Isaac Perlman was on the other side. And it was just really thrilling. And the audience is, it, 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 even though it's, an, it's people are forgetting who Rita Hayworth was, the story is, uh, is really what prices of fame and what do these women have to go through back in the golden age of Hollywood and how strong and powerful, because even though her end was Alzheimer's, this is a celebration of a woman that achieved so many things in spite of people knocking her down. And she just kept getting up and getting better and getting stronger uh, as long as she could. And it's a celebration of that. But it's also, Carter's book is very poignant and people really lean forward because it's, um, it's it's emotional and it's fun and it's sexy and and um, it's heartfelt. Well, good for good for you and good for Carter. <clears throat> so the collaboration is is is, is, is key here. I think you know everything's a collaboration. I, I look at at my rock and roll shows. I mean, how we're all part of. You know, we're all okay. So wait a second. Let's t let's talk about the rock and roll shows because that's an, an aspect of you I don't know. No, I know. I, I mean, well, it's a new one for me. It's, it's, I've only been doing it for five years. <laughs> so. How much of your of your time do you spend um, performing? Are you are you full time performer at this point in your career? Well, I just got out of COVID, so I mean, I'm start. I started performing again at um, don't. Uh, I'm doing this run at Don't Tell Mamas, and then I'll it'll launch us back into the theaters, and then we need we'll we'll get less to Broadway out but I've Paul asked me um, to direct a, a show called Rebel Rebel the Many Lives of David Bowie and it's it's a theatrical concert and I'm like who am I I'm like this little girl from you know cabaret I mean how how I I wasn't allowed to listen to pop music when I was growing up I bought the We Will Rock You album and my with my own allowance money and my mom made me return it and she said this is mind pollution <laughs> and so I was like I mean so I was like, who am I to do this? And then I started researching Bowie and, and I came up with this concept where we have, David Bowie believed that we have many lives that we live and that we're different characters in our lives. And so I came up with this idea to put a, you know, it's it's a tribute show, but it, it's not because it, it's, I have Ziggy, I have the Thin White Duke and I have, um, I have the iconic Bowie, and it's as though you're seeing them like in different times of Bowie's careers, these different uh, 
characters that he created. And it's just, a re it's really wonderful. And we play casinos and performing arts centers. We just, I, we just uh, recast and performed uh, at the Schomburg Festival in Chicago at, at the beginning of September for 20,000 people in IMAG. And I was so proud of my, my guys. I mean, we, you know, it's, it's just a beautiful show. So, um, so, so let's see. You mentioned you mentioned a thing called COVID, which I think I've heard of. Yes. Um, so it sucks. <laughs> so what happened to you? What happened to you? You you were booked. You were you were scheduled for performances. How we how did COVID? Yeah, we had performances scheduled for all of our shows through uh, you know through twenty twenty two and and how, how many how many shows do you do you have at the moment that are that are actively being performed? Well, I just. We just started with with Queen and and we started with Queen in July, and we've I don't know we've done maybe thirty shows since the end since mid July. Thirty different shows. Thirty concerts, yeah, all wow. over the country in amphitheaters. We're playing big, um, we you know, at Atlanta. We were just in Palm Springs at the show. Um, we, I mean. We've been everywhere. We're going to the Adrian Arch Center in Miami. Um, we go to Providence, Rhode Island, to the Providence Playhouse. We just were, were in Durham, uh, North Carolina, two weeks ago. That was our first indoor concert, and that was weird. It was really weird. But let's 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 go back to March fifteenth, March twelfth. Uh, yes, so March. March eleventh, I saw my last Broadway show, and then Broadway closed on the twelfth, and everything went into shutdown. So, yes, I had I had Book of Mormon tickets for the twelfth, and then we left the thirteenth for Mexico. So, but you you were able to leave. Yeah, because they hadn't closed everything down, and we were going. We got married at, 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 in um, El uh, Maroma, Mexico, and so my husband and I went for our first wedding anniversary, and and we were taking our dog, and um, so we, we went to the the resort where we got married. And um, that's when everything started shutting down. And there were lots of Europeans and there were a, a lot of Canadians and a lot of British people. And it's a very intimate, um, they have overwater bungalows and everything, it's, it's beautiful. And Paul and I wound up staying there for three months and we were the only couple with, with the exception of Vinny and Nancy, a couple from um, Connecticut. And then we were the only people for the last month. We were there for three months, and we shot a documentary, which um, is going to air at the end of the at the beginning of next month on M N N, and then we're gonna we're gonna shop it around. It's an amazing, it's really a powerful documentary about you know the isolation. Even though you're in a beautiful place like that, we were quarantined with the um, with, with the staff and got to know them, and all the food was organic, and there was no COVID there. And so really. We had, well, I mean, not at that point, no. Oh. And so we're that... watching. Well, we were watching Cuomo on, you know, on the TV. And so you're talking about March through April, May, like June, June, March through June. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we wound up, it was. I mean, if you're going to be someplace, that was a great place to be. But it was. It was really surreal, and and so we decided that we'd shoot. I just shot on my iPhone, and I've been editing it for a long time and I'm really proud of it. It's a really beautiful piece about connection, isolation, about not knowing. And uh, it's, 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 I'm, I'm really excited about it. So, so you, you were, hmm, you were in isolation for three months, but you found a way to be, to be creative and productive. Yes. Was it, yeah, was it a defense mechanism against going crazy or did, or, or inspiration? I think both. Because I even put in the film, like, you know, you're in paradise, but there's nobody to talk to other than the staff. I mean, I was trying to learn Spanish, of course, and we had, thank God we had our, our dog Zoe with us. And, um, you, you know, we were connecting with people, but also with nature, because when all the people left, nature started encroaching on, to, you know, onto the, onto the resort. And the only reason why the resort was open was uh, we knew the owners of the resort. It, it was a private, uh, private beach, so we we really lucked out. I won't. I wouldn't tell a lot of people about how you spent COVID. <laughs> well, I, the film is really interesting because because you know even though you're in paradise, the you know you, you 
go stir crazy. And then the anxiety of, of seeing what's happening in New York was just awful. I mean, and yeah, we were in pretty bad shape. We were, we were, we were the center of the, of the pandemic. Uh, I know that's that why we didn't want to come back. Yeah. So. Un understandable. Um, so how about bookings? How about sh sh your, your plans? How, how, how much did you have planned that, that got canceled? Oh my God. It's, it's been crazy. We, Paul had to reschedule shows five, six times. And now we're, and now we're, we're booked all through 2022. And, um, it's, you know, now performing arts centers are getting so booked. There's so much talent and, and they had to, a lot of the places are having to service the 2021, uh, you know, shows as well as the or 20, 20 shows as well as 2021. Yeah. So there's a lot of catch up, a lot of catch up. Everybody's playing a lot of catch up and, a, and really short staffed. Like we were, when we were at Agua Caliente last week, I mean, you just have to be really careful because you, to order food as a band member, you have to order in advance because there's not enough, you can't get into the restaurant and get served in time, you know, to do your show or, you know, and catering, you have to make sure everything is advanced way, way in advance to have food. Um, and you wouldn't think that things like that would be a problem, but it, it is in touring. Well, you get. I think I, I think I lost a, a beat somewhere because you, you're talking about touring, but you weren't you weren't touring during during 2020 or 2021. Are you talking about now? You're yeah, talking about now, now. Now we started touring in July. Okay, got it. So you're back. You're back on tour. You're back. You're doing yeah, it we've again. Been back on, but yeah. what did Paul, how many how many other than you? How how much talent does Paul represent? Well, we have. He has a. We have a show called um, Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Wall, and we have The Rebel Rebel, The Many Lives of David Bowie, The Ultimate Queen Celebration starring Mark Martell, which you know, the film just catapulted us into. So uh, what, I'm trying to, what I'm trying to get at, it, I, I don't want to, I'm not trying to be negative, but I'm try, just trying to get to, to, the, to the impact that shutdown must have had on, on Paul's business, as well as your, your, your career. There must have been some effect. Oh yeah, we had no work. Okay, there. there. Now that's that's. There, was, there, there was I. You know. Did you? But did you did make any? Get Seven Eleven. Did you? Did you do any kind of kind of pivot to to uh, to virtual uh, performance? Yes. Um, well, first of all, I my lifeline was um, I took every online class that M and M Manhattan Neighborhood Network had. And I learned Premiere and I learned to edit and I, start, I, I started doing a TV show monthly called Secrets of the Stage with Quinn Lemley. And I interview people like you're interviewing me now. I mean, I normally did it in the studio, but with COVID for a long time, the studios were closed. And then when they, so when they were closed, they started offering virtual classes. And I did, I took every class that I could possibly do. And then when the studios did open, I went every day for two hours and, and edited. And that was really cathartic and creative for me. I don't know what I would have done. And the other thing is, is my voice teacher and musical director, uh, Andrew Wheeler lives down the street. He's in the seventies. And so he and his partner and Paul and I were the only people that bubbled together during, during COVID. And so I was able to, we, we were able to sing through, through COVID which thank God. Would you say that over the years, I mean, I, I, I assume that the answer is going to be yes. So would you say you've developed a following? Do, do you have, do you have audiences that, that, that are looking forward to seeing you? Yes. Yes. I, I, I and I'm looking forward to seeing them. So yeah, I've, I've really, you know, I, in, I, tr what I'm trying to do is come from very, you know, I'm trying to use film and TV as a medium and, cabaret and, and music as a medium and theater the, with the theatricality of the Rita Hayward show. And so I'm, I'm trying to do all of that. And, but they all kind of cross together in, in a way. But I want to point out the fact that you did this, <laughs> that, that you, you, you were, you were doing something during shutdown that was keeping, keeping your image. Oh, there's, there's. Sorry, the, it's New York. You it's guys. New York. It's New York. Now we know. Now we know where we are. You're in New York. Okay. Yes. Um. 
So you were doing something during COVID that that was maintaining your image, maintaining your communication with with your audiences. Is that a fair thing to say? Yes. I also another thing that I did that was really great. I'm a member of Toastmasters International, and I was the club president. And of course, I've I've played many leadership roles, but I I made myself do public speaking every week. And I was doing I was doing speeches, and then I got then I got this article in it's called My Turn in Toastmasters International for August, and they did a whole expose on me. It was wonderful, so that gave me a global audience, and it was all about you know how Toastmasters and public speaking and leadership helped me as a performer and as a producer and director. And so that was that was really great. I tried to find as many outlets of communicating as I could during COVID. And the most challenging thing I had was, I, I, for those of you that are musical artists, Zoom is a really weird place for for music because the, the, there's syncing issues. And I was asked to do in May. I was asked to be the headliner for uh, for a synagogue. They would this temple. Um, in New Rochelle wanted me to, to headline and, and do a set for them. And I, I really had a lot of problems because you can, I couldn't sing to either a, a clickback track without having you know issues. And so what I did was I went to Dubway Studios where I recorded my last CD and we were in the studio and I was able to have speakers in front of me and I've never done a concert where I'm sitting in my gown and my feathers and I'm like just singing to all these people with this playback. It was surreal, but I, I figured it out and I did it and I it, that was really important to me and they raised a lot of money and that was great, but it was it was just a totally different way to perform because I didn't have my musicians. I couldn't put people in a room together. And, you know, and so we were in the, I was in the sound booth by myself and I had an engineer in another room and then we were Zooming and then Paul and his friend in LA, Marco Jalakam, who's a composer, they were like trying to do all the, the sound testing prior on Zoom for Mar uh, Paul up here and uh, on the Upper West Side and Marco in LA. So that was a really interesting uh, experiment because I was reading, I was calling every musician I knew. How do you do these concerts where you can be in sync? Yeah, it's it's there's a, lots of uh, conversations about that that we're all having. Um, let me ask you this: uh, we we know that you you have to have the, the the accompaniment has to be in the same place, the same location as the singer one way or the other either the, either you're in a room with them or, or you have a track that's, that's playing while you're singing um has uh, the, the other problem that that, that we have is that particularly with zoom is that zoom only recognizes one voice at a time right so that there's a problem so there's a problem with with zoom knowing wh whether to let us hear the, the the background track or whether to hear your voice how well, did you solve we, that well what we did was I was in the sound booth and I had two I had two little speakers in front of the screen like it would be you know here so I because I didn't want to wear headphones I mean how can I vamp it up if I'm wearing my headphones right and, yeah we haven't heard the, the the phrase sexy headphones ever oh, not yet well I mean beats are great for editing but I I just for performing I, I mean I tried everything and so so what the engineer he was in the other room and so I was singing into the mic and even though I could hear the, um, because the other thing was I didn't want to sound completely dry. Like I, I was just singing in my bathroom, you know, cause this was a benefit and you know, it was a big deal. So I, so what he did was he was playing the music into my room so I could hear the music, but he was mixing my voice and mixing the back, the background vocals together in the booth and sending that via zoom did he have something like obs or one of one of those softwares that that, that is a mix, mixing software yeah yeah I that's the problem you see we, we can't we can't just do it on zoom we, we have to do it through through a, a um application that that actually can mix the voices 
Right. And that was so frustrating for me because I was like looking into buying these little mixers and these things. But how can I play my music, perform, be present and be mixing and doing all of the technical stuff? I, I just. Oh, if anybody can do it, you can do it. <laughs> no, I. So, so that's so we I that was it was Paul's idea to call the studio and and I knew the owner and he was like, well, we've never done it before, but we'll try. And it worked. So thank goodness. I want more details about that. Maybe not now, but I want, I want to know how to yeah. do it. Because we, 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 we're doing a workshop on Sunday where people are presenting songs uh, from, from their musicals that they're working on. And I, you know, I, want to, I want to know as much as I can to advise people when they're doing this so they can do the best possible presentations. We're very yeah. forgiving. And, and are, but you're, you're talking about a professional situation where you're actually raising money and you have right. to come off very polished um, we don't we're not expecting our presentations to be polished but if they could right. be that wouldn't be that wouldn't be a bad thing well the other thing um I, you know unfortunately um i we we were supposed to be in canada at the beginning of september after we did the schramsberg festival in chicago and we tested positive for covid and i didn't have any symptoms but paul did and and it so that i couldn't go to Canada. We had 10, 10 days of shows. And so we had to advance the show and at least the band was okay. And um, it was a blessing in disguise for me because I all of a sudden had time and I could work on Rita and work with Carter on Zoom and work with my musical director. And I learned, I, I don't know if this is a trick for composers or if you're accompanying you can't sing together, but all of the, the intros and in between, he would play and then I would sing a cappella, and then he would play in between. And that actually was very helpful. And it was also a really amazing ear training um, experiment. Well, it sounds challenging. Everything in COVID yeah, has been but, challenging. But that's how we did it. And it, and it, it really was very effective. And um, so, I mean, that's, that was the only way that we knew how to, to get through the song together, but you can't play together. So when, when did you test positive? When was that? Uh, the 3rd of September. So it's, it's relatively recent. So, uh, and is Paul all better now? He still can't taste anything. Oh so. dear. But, oh, I'm know, sorry to hear that. Tired. So sorry to hear yeah. that. Well, you know what I think it was, Bob, was, well, we were in Vancouver or in Seattle, I don't know, we were in Seattle, and then we um, we, we did the um, the winery Saint Michel. We did a, a big outdoor event, and there there were so many people there, and they weren't wearing. I mean, a, a lot of these places are not people are not wearing masks, and I mean we're so lucky that we're in New York because New Yorkers really take it seriously, and especially in the South, they're just not you know, and a lot of them are not getting vaccinated. And a lot of the venues are not, I have to say Durham Performing Arts Center was incredible with the masks. Everybody had to wear masks and you had to show your vaccination card to go inside. But that was our first indoor concert. At this point, would you, re would you turn down a gig if, you, if they weren't using COVID protocols? Um, or would you risk it? If you're on stage, I don't think it's... It, the the COVID protocols for backstage in almost every venue is pretty strict, so it's not like it it's being in the front of the house that you have to worry, you know, okay. like you know, which is where that's where Paul may have, yeah. So that's where it it gets you know backstage though you're you're far away and we were mainly playing amphitheaters outdoors, uh, people were really. Um, I, I have to tell you, I, every time I think about this, I can't, I can't believe that you, you play in these huge, huge venues, a solo show and a huge, it must be so, I mean, at first it must have been very daunting. I'm sure you're used to it by now. Well, I have to say I learned a lot in, I learned so much from starting in the smaller rooms because it's uh, because of the intimacy and and connecting with the people because you actually can see in their faces and their eyes and and then when you when you get on a bigger stage like the Kravitz Center and you're like on a, a stage as big as the Met and you're like trucking you know <laughs> to get from one side it's just you and um, the longest entrances you've ever had to make yeah really 
so I, I mean that's a very different thing but you the one thing that I learned is you can't um, even though you play bigger you still have to be connected and intimate with everyone even just in an amplified way well that's uh, a, a lot of credit to you for, for being able to do this um, and to, to be a successful touring artist uh, with a, a solo show in in a I mean I just keep I just keep thinking oh my god you you are this an entire list this huge <laughs> stage and there you are and you have to fill it at, with your personality and with your with your well, with your I, art I mean, with your art is I mean it I mean like band the, the well you band have you had the band but but it's really you the focus is on you so um, congratulations on what I consider an incredibly successful career I'm I'm okay. very um, very impressed I've known you for so long and I've just seen you just build and build and build and it's just been it's been heartening just to see see somebody who has so much success that um, I know so many people who struggle um, with their careers um, and I know I know you've had your struggles I'm sure it's not all been easy but um, Thank you, Bob. The, well, you know what I the one thing uh, when I was interviewed by Toastmasters I um, I my big takeaway is that as much as you can say yes say yes when opportunities come because a lot of times it's fear that stops us from from taking a risk or you know taking an opportunity if we're not certain for it and I'm somebody who really likes to be well rehearsed and and I don't like winging things or anything like that unless I have to but um, during the height of the um, recession the, during the Obama years we were creating burlesque to Broadway and uh, it was rough and we were at a at the small business expo and Paul and I were trying to get funding from um, oh score was helping us try to get funding for for the show and we had our our advisor and everything it's seniors that that had esteemed careers and they volunteer and they help businesses or artists and we really created a business and we needed funding to go to the next level we wanted to do new orchestrations and new costumes and we wanted to add girls and we wanted to go to um, APAP the Association of Performing Arts um, performing presenters and we needed money for it and so we were touring but we were trying to produce the show with our you know what we were getting paid for the gigs and we I there was a 30 second pitch for Shark Tank for season five and my girlfriend was like oh you and Paul you've worked on this pitch with score so much you should just do the pitch and so we did and we got called back and we got called back and then we were supposed to be on season five which was quite, I'm so glad things didn't happen the way they did because um, I asked a friend, a fellow Toastmaster who does numbers and I had to do all these spreadsheets for the sharks and everything because they give you a producer that, that really teaches you how to project your business and everything. And we were looking at producing as a business and the show as a business. And she and so she I had to tell her what I was doing it for. And she said, well, um, I just came into a lot of money and I, I really would like to do something glamorous and sexy. And I think you're a great performer. And so if the sharks don't bite, I'd like to be your associate producer. And so the next day, the producers called and they, the sharks said they weren't going to um, invest in season five and anymore in the arts and entertainment space to come back next year. And we didn't want to wait a year. And so she, Lois became the perfect producing partner and we did everything we recorded a cd we went to the conferences which was a way of getting on on these big stages for your listeners i mean to go to the conferences and boy some, sometimes when the universe opens doors it, you can't you can't miss it <laughs> but but i said but you know the thing was was that I didn't know Lois, she was just a Toastmaster. And I was just sharing, like all of your true members are telling everybody what they're doing and they're doing such exciting work. And I was just sharing what I was doing and she was a fan of mine, but we didn't know each other. And for her to say, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna be a part of this. And, and her being, cause she's a more numbers, you know, scientist kind of person and then to come in this world of show business and glamour and feathers and sequins and fans it opened up her world too so 
it, it was just a great marriage of, of um, creativity and Paul was, is so good at what he does. And so it was, it was magical. It's, it's, it's very specific. What you're saying is very specific, but it's, it has a universal application to everybody in this room. Uh, we all have to remember that we're in a glamorous business. Um, people actually have a lot more fun investing and losing money in, in, in theater than, than they have uh, losing money in the stock market. Theater's well, just more fun. They want to be fun. part of the process. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's well, something that like, we, we, we all have to remember that. I mean, yeah. we're, not, we're not Rita Hayworth. We're not, we're not that kind of glamour, but theater itself has a glamour to it. So um, I, I want to, because uh, Quinn has to leave soon, so I want to open up to questions from the room. Um, I, is there anything that you want to know about, about Quinn's process and Quinn's journey and, and her ability to, to book these tours? And we didn't even talk about your, 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 um, your TV shows. You talked about MNN a little bit. But we yeah, really well, if anybody much. is interested in, you know, like I, I interview, I do these interviews and it's all about the creative process and secrets of the stage and entrepreneurship. So, you know, email me at Quinn at QuinnLemley.com or if you want to see my shows, you know, and Paul's website is CamaTalent.com. Can you, can but, you type it into, into the yeah, chat? And I also put, I also put the URL for my, for the Rita Hayworth show. Oh, I did it. Um, I have to do it to everybody. I just did it to you, uh, Judy. Hold on, I have to figure out everyone. But, um, you know, I'm always looking for to interview people on the creative process because it's- uh, You've got a room full of possible interviewees here. Yes. Um, so everybody, I want, I want to, you, you can either just turn your audio on and ask questions if you like, but I, I prefer if you would raise your hand. Do you, do you know how to do a virtual hand raise? There's a reactions thing at the bottom of your screen. Arlene Corsano, sure. Your question? You have to turn on, you turn on, turn on your, uh, unmute yourself. Turn unmute. on your audio. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> My question is about cabaret. Uh, usually, I guess, Don't Tell Mama has a blanket uh, license. Um, so you don't have to go, you know, after your, Sinatra songs or whatever. Are there large venues that that yes. have the blanket license? So it's just when you well, do. Well, no. It, I mean, you have to make sure that for some of them your show that you have that. I mean, you have to cover. You have to make sure the composers and writers are taken care of through ASCAP and BMI. So right, right. yeah. Well, so that, if you if you had ASCAP a, would pay through there. So yeah, but, but I mean, you don't have to go. You know, like if you're doing a musical, I have to go and say, can I use this? And what's the, the deal? You have to go in. No, ask you're, you're asking a very good question, Arlene. And, and um, Rita, uh, Quinn is, is, is actually answering it. For the most part, yes, she can't assume that the venues that she goes to have, have an ASCAP li license or a BMI. No, we, li request, we request that for our show, it's taken out. Right. So, they, so they'll choice. take it out for your show. Yeah. Okay, okay. Good. Even some of the larger, uh, you know, like a thousand people or five hundred, uh, when they're doing that, like not just small, like uh, no, they, they have blanket licenses also. Well, you have to make sure that they right. Do yeah, but I mean, but some of them your, can. for your the show. Yeah. There should have been some of them. Some of them might. Some of the larger. Okay. Right. Thank you, you want that in your contract. Right. Thank yeah. You. If you if you had to go after the. Uh, I forget whether it's the Grand Rights or the other one, but that's uh, for like a, a musical, musical, you know, uh, like tribute shows and things like that, or just their tribute shows, and that's that's like a cabaret show kind of thing. So uh, d defined that way because there's no necessarily characters or script uh, right. involved, mm -hmm. which is a tricky area that Equity keeps an eye on, but if, for for argument's sake, let's just say there's no there's no actual script or um, scenes. Right, it's like for our songs. Queen show, Mark just sings. It's a rock band, and he's he's just phenomenal, and he sounds exactly like Freddie Mercury, and he just sings. You know, he's Mark Martell. I saw the music, the, the movie. Yes, he does. He sounds yeah. just like him. He does. <laughs> Astonishing. Um, any other questions from the room? You, you raise your hand or, or you can come in come into the room and ask whatever, whatever you like because we're winding down now nobody okay so 
you, I promise you, you'd be out at six thirty because I think you have uh, an, uh, an obligation of some sort. An obligation. An obligation. Well, it's been so much fun. You you ask such great questions, and I, I mean, my goodness, everybody's doing such exciting projects, and it's it's exciting. People want live theater. They they want to engage, and I mean, just seeing the excitement out there on the road, people are just so hungry to be back out there and and after covid live theater is and music is just it's really filling something that people need more than ever now i've been to two live uh, performances both were both were solo shows uh, i went to one near near where i live at uh, on the, the urban stages did a uh, one woman show um uh, oh they do great work and it was it was wonderful. They they we were all we were for the most part we were masked, but we were all socially distanced. And then I went to Goodspeed um, back in August, I think it was. And they didn't open their theater, but they created a tent space, an outdoor tent space, uh, in their parking lot. Goodspeed in the parking lot, um, and yeah. that was also socially distanced and masked. And I I felt I felt pretty safe, pretty safe. I'm a, I'm cautious and I'm. I'm also extremely vulnerable about about all that sort of health stuff, so I have to be really caref careful. Um, but um, it was great, and you're right. I mean, being being there in a live performance and feeling the electricity that happens, the unlike anything else, it's, it's unlike anything else in show business. The, the the live performance is different than the screen, than the, than, than the video, than anything. Um, more than any other art form, I think theater is, is interactive and you're shaped so much by your audiences. So, um, see if there are any other, uh, well, Paul, did you have a question? Well, I just wanted to say, I'm glad you're doing Rita and you mentioned your reference to Gilda. Gilda is my very, very favorite movie of all time. It's so much like my life. So I, I'm glad you're doing that. It's like well, your come, life. Come see the show. You'll it's 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 really fun so everybody should come see the show uh when are you yeah, when you're you playing it till the end of i put the url or just go to don't tell mama new york nyc.com and i'm i play once a month through the end of of March. when's your next show next thursday next at thursday at yeah, don't tell mama's the heat is yeah. on the heat is the on heat everyone is on. It's okay. going to be fun. We got a rave review in cabaret scenes, and we're doing a big write up. And Sherry Eaker's coming on Thursday, and oh, so it's just I should come just to see, just see Sherry. I haven't I seen know, Sherry in seen years. Her. I know. Years. I know. So I'm going to give you a, the official thank you for for being with us. Thank you for for sharing and being very generous and sharing your information. Um, oh, you. We, I do this with hopes that that people will be inspired to keep going and learn from from other people and find ways to be creative uh and now that we're, we're going live i you know i think we're i think we're all in the on the on the brink of of basically being in, in a, a world of live performance again but I, I don't think we're quite there but i think we're on the way so um thank you again quinn lumley uh my old old friend who i don't see nearly enough um, and thank you all to my viewers out there in YouTube land uh, and to the people in the room as well. I reminder the, the weekly reminder, we do this as a service to the community. You don't have to pay to be here, but it sure helps us if you, if you do give a donation. So it's truedonate.com, T-R-U donate.com, where you can actually donate to us and, and keep us running. Um, I will say it. I said it before. I'll say it again. Thank you, community. You've been incredibly support, supportive. The people in the room, people out there, the people in general in, in the true world, uh, just kept us going and kept us very strong and vital and healthy. And um, I, I just don't want you to take us for granted. You have to keep supporting us because at some point the money will run out if we don't have it coming in. So again, thank you and join us next week where I'm going to have a conversation with a concert pianist who I went to elementary school with, Beth Levin, uh, an inspiration in my life. And she has some very interesting things to talk about uh, the parallels between 
classic piano and acting. And uh, I hope you'll join join me next week. And uh, thanks, everybody. Come into the room now, and we'll get ready to do breakout rooms. I think Quinn Quinn just took off. Yes, she did. So that's it for this week. Hello, Judy. Let's see. Gallery view. Let's put video settings. I don't video participants. All right, there you all are. So um, I'm going to do uh, breakout rooms. Um, Quinn wasn't able to stay. I, I, I think you, you know that, right? So I'm going to just open up three rooms, and you can just go into a room that you want. I know, Jane, I know you like me to assign it, but every, every week it just becomes, I wind up moving everybody into rooms anyway. Um, unmute yourself so I can hear so I can hear your exasperation. Oh, no, I, I, I let people choose wherever they want. But I'm only here for about ten minutes. Oh, that's what it was. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's so all I wanted rooms. to say. <laughs> okay. I'm just going to do three rooms, and um, I'm going to open them, and you're going to randomly be going into rooms. Uh, thanks, everybody. Thanks for being here, and turn on your videos. Proper breakout room etiquette is to have your video on so people know who they're talking to. You should be getting invitations to the rooms and you just accept the invitation. Gary ran out of the room. Hello, Gary. What? You're a mute. You want me to leave? Leave where? Here. Why? I just noticed that you 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 ran out of the the breakout room. Oh, I guess you didn't go in. You just never joined. That's it. Got it. No. Oh, well, that's not I guess. I saw Paul there. I thought you were talking about talking. To him. No. Not until I know what's going on. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna make vague accusations without knowing right. what's what. I will leave. <laughs>